Hello and welcome, guys. This is Ukrainian Toronto Television Podcast. My name is Melania Podryak. This is Mark Kaplan. And we have a hey. guest today. His, hey. <laughs> His name is Konstantin Batoski. He is a Ukrainian political analyst. But most importantly, he has 10 years of experience in the nuclear industry. And today we're going to talk about, yes, you're absolutely right, about Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and everything to do with that. Konstantin, welcome and hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. So the question number one that bothers everyone. Um, so, I mean, everybody's a nuclear scientist today and everybody knows that. Everybody has watched the Chernobyl series. Yes, everybody knows everything about nuclear bombs. Everybody played Fallout. So obviously, both online, offline and, you know, on TV and, and internet, we have heard different versions of all sorts of consequences that may arise in the uh, nuclear industry because of the threats uh, that had to do with, uh, have to do with the British nuclear power station, especially Russians. Um, and different consequences are kind of exist in the, in this new cycle. Different experts have different opinions. What is the worst case scenario in this situation? What is the most realistic case scenario? And is this going to be the second, the third uh, um, Chernobyl, Fukushima, whatever it is? So could you bring more clarity into this? Sure. Uh, well, to start with, uh, Zaporizhia NPP uh, is not the same kind of reactor and nuclear power plant as we had in Chernobyl. That's what, that, what has to be stressed. Uh, these are two different types of reactors. They must be distinguished. It's not like two different types of car. It's like a car and uh, a railroad carriage. So these are completely different things. The second thing is that uh, reactors uh, at Zaporizhia nuclear power plant are now uh, in a special mode, which is called cold shutdown. It means that there is no chain reaction inside the reactor. So uh, there is no possibility of occurring uh, chain reaction in these conditions. The reactors are shut down. Uh, they still produce some heat because it is needed in order to maintain all systems uh, and in order to guarantee safety of operations. But there is no chain reaction. So uh, even if something happens, uh, there won't, will not be huge radioactive release in the atmosphere. It will just not happen because there is nothing to release. There are no uh, harmful, disastrous, dangerous isotopes such as iodine, for instance, radioactive iodine. And uh, that is why there, people should just not by any means take uh, any iodine pillows Please don't do it. Everyone who has it, just throw these tablets away. They will not help you. It's not that kind but of why accident. do people say they'll help them? Uh, because uh, when the real chain reaction happens, uh, the temperatures are very high and some very dangerous isotopes are released in the atmosphere, such as radio radioactive iodine. And in order to uh, protect uh, human organism, uh, people take uh, one pill, and it should be taken uh, something like four from four to six hours before the explosion. So you should be warned that there will be explosion. And in this case, maybe uh, your hormone system would adapt uh, to uh, digest radioactive iodine. But only if you take it before uh, the real uh, explosion or real release of radiation. So uh, you cannot protect yourself uh, nowadays with this type of objects uh, as we have in Zaporizhia nuclear power plant with iodine. Uh, please, by uh, never means don't take it. It's harmful. It's dangerous. And uh, knowing, uh, of course, it doesn't concern English-speaking audience, but uh, it concerns some Russian-speaking audience. Uh, please don't drink iodine because you will burn your throat. Uh, or you can drink it if you're Russian. I don't care. That. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Yeah. But like, what's the worst case scenario? What Russians can blow up? Can they blow up anything which will harm Ukraine ecologically or kill many Physically. people? Physically. Yeah. In, in a scenario, if they blown up something, uh, there will be release of uh, some uh, parts of uh, nuclear fuel. Um, 
this release will happen on some area, let's say, from 30 to 50 kilometers uh, from the nuclear power station, and that's it. Uh, there will not be released to the atmosphere. There will not be radioactive cloud or this kind of mushroom explosion that would take all that west, uh, waste up to the atmosphere. This will not happen. Uh, there will be an accident. Uh, the parts would be just thrown all over and would be collected. Uh, humans can collect such things. It's not that toxic that, you know, we should leave that uh, place untouched. Uh, human would inter humans would interfere, clean up the mess, and that will be it in a case if they somehow blow it up. But uh, the thing is that in order to bring an explosion, you have to use a real, real uh, powerful explosive. Uh, it won't be enough to hit it by a rocket. Uh, it won't be enough to throw a kind of a bomb, that regular bomb, aviation bomb that people have even uh, of a net to up to one ton uh, kilowatts. It just will not work. These uh, reactors were built in Soviet Union and uh, in most of them were built in 1980s and uh, they were designed uh, in order to sustained during uh, a possible nuclear conflict. So they are pretty much strong. The worst, worst scenario is almost unimaginable. But since we're dealing with the Russians, we have to be prepared uh, for the worst ever possible scenario. So the worst ever possible scenario if, uh, is that uh, Russia could deliver uh, a nuclear bomb to the nuclear oh. power station. In this case, there will be uh, a big temperature, uh, big enough to melt down concrete and iron, and the chain reaction, which is now shut down, would be launched. So one explosion would lead definitely to another explosion. But uh, it's a kind of a global catastrophe and the third World War apocalyptic scenario, which uh, I'm not think we should rely on. But in theory, that is the most ever worst possible scenario that could happen. Interesting. So, um, so the worst case scenario, we have a nuclear explosion of a nuclear bomb, which in, in and of itself is already a problem, right? We don't need a nuclear power plant to be there for a nuclear disaster from a nuclear bomb to be a problem, right? Otherwise, it's still kind of sort of a problem, but it's a problem that can be solved with proper cleanup. And exactly. also, I would imagine that there would, if in case something happened, there would be some difficulties, especially since the big part of the, I mean, the plant is occupied and then, um, I mean, it, it would be very difficult to reach certain places, right? Where that, uh, where those debris would fall down, right? So, so I guess that's the biggest concern. Is, is, is there, is there, is there a threat for water because it, it, the Dnieper River flows there? Uh, is there a threat for like contaminating of water, which will contaminate something else, fish, et cetera, or there is none? Well, r uh, radiation is, uh, an exposure. It's a wave. Uh, any wave has its source. So as soon as you eliminate the source, there is no wave, no exposure. So the task is to clean up the mess and it can be done. And Ukraine has uh, unfortunately unique experience and expertise in this matter because we were cleaning up uh, the Chernobyl a nuclear power station. And uh, there are some very basic things which will be then done. Uh, people would encircle the area, isolate it, and then anything that goes out from that area would be just washed down. Now the water will clean up, will take all the sources away. And then uh, we will just discover and we will find uh, big obstacles and big parts that can be collected. And of course, we will not eliminate it, you know, till the very tiny uh, nucleus. It is just impossible. But uh, we would generally make the area more or less uh, uh, good for people, sustainable for people. So it's not that we will turn that area in no man's land and water will be uh, infected uh, and uh, polluted for ages. No. 
Okay, so, <clears throat> but still, uh, not a great scenario. Nobody wants a nuclear power plant to blow up, right? That would be a terrible thing that happens. I mean, we've noticed industrial uh, buildings and uh, industrial complexes destroyed in this war and obviously helps no one. So <clears throat> it's better to prevent that. It's better for that not to happen. Russians better be stopped. But so what is the role of uh, IAEA in this? And is there enough done to prevent this sort of, I mean, still a catastrophe. So this war has revealed the huge bunch of problems with all international organization and international atomic energy agency is not an exception. And to start off, uh, the International Atomic Agency is a nuclear watchdog. It is the technical organization uh, which operates on the mandate of United Nations that uh, delivers technical information about development of nuclear programs in different countries and uh, uses this information in order to protect humanity from the spread, uh, unauthorized spread of uh, military uh, nuclear technologies. So that's their main objective. That organization was formed after 1957, I guess, by United States and Soviet Union. And since that time, it is uh, actually infiltrated with uh, Russian uh, operatives. They hold uh, a stake of control in International Atomic Agency. And in some occasions, uh, International Atomic Agency can go political and go just beyond that role of technical watchdog and give political assessment of what actually has happened. We know, for instance, to what extent the world was watching uh, on Iranian uh, nuclear program and uh, the entire uh, the question of military in intervention was actually dependent on the assessment from uh, International Atomic Agency. And uh, then the agency was very accurate. Uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, humanity just doesn't know uh, lots of examples of uh, conducting military operations in the nuclear power plant. So once Israel attacked Iranian uh, nuclear power plant in 1970s during uh, Israeli-Iranian war, then there was an accident, an attempt of Serbian army to attack uh, Croatian nuclear power plant called Kursko during Yugoslavian wars in the 1990s. And uh, at that, uh, when those events happened, the agency played a very proactive role. For instance, they called for all sides to halt. They uh, persuaded uh, operators to shut down operations. When uh, Russia annexed uh, the biggest nuclear power plant in Europe, uh, the International Atomic Agency uh, was just stunned and devastated with that news. They couldn't react for a few months. During those few months, actually, the station was on a full operation mode. So there was a uh, chain reaction reactors and reactors were in operation mode. Uh, Ukraine, of course, because from the Ukrainian perspective, everything what had happened uh, at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant since March the 4th, when the Russians occupied uh, the site, is a terrorist act. And the Ukrainian operator, uh, our state-run company, Energa Atom, of course, uh, lost the controls. And our state regulator, of course, stated that uh, the nuclear power station now operates in a legal mode because it's occupied by strange people and uh, no one knows who they are uh, what qualifications do they have and who is responsible for entire nuclear safety then so what ukrainian ukraine wanted from uh international atomic agency is to go there and to tell to entire world that there is a terrorist act happened the act of nuclear terrorism that an operating nuclear power plant was just taken to into hostages by Russian army. Uh, this is an argument for United Nations, for all international bodies uh, that can actually uh, then sue Russia for this act of terrorism. But uh, the Director General, Rafael Grossi, Argentinian diplomat, who is now, who runs the agency, 
uh, said that his agency is just a technical organization. They cannot give any political assessment. They just mm. try to watch uh, for nuclear safety. And when the mission first went uh, to Zaporizhia almost a year ago, they stated that all seven pillars of nuclear safety were broken. Uh, that the object is in a, under huge threat, but they refused to name the site and name the responsible one and name the site who should do something about it. Uh, then Director General has tried to settle the situation and somehow to break a deal between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and this policy also didn't happen at, didn't happen at all. So what now agency does is that they have a mission uh, and this situation is almost like the situation with OSC mission in Ukraine, which was here in 1914. So the key objective of these people is to monitor and report. And what they monitor and report sometimes does not really correl with the real situation. For instance, they report on a daily basis that the radiation uh, uh, level of ra background radiation is under control, that it's uh, everything is good, the level of water is good. Uh, and everyone thinks that the station is in a safe mode, you know, since all the key parameters are uh, good. Everyone thinks that the situation is okay, but it's not okay because the station is uh, occupied and uh, it is occupied by terrorists, mm -hmm. at least from Ukrainian legal point of view. And that is the fact that uh, the International Atomic Agency just doesn't want to recognize and doesn't want to acknowledge and doesn't do anything about it. And it is the problem Although because, yes, of course it could. Uh, for instance, they could uh, suggest uh, adjustments to international treaties uh, because they actually, they are watchdogs, they follow these treaties on how they are implemented in all parts of the world. Uh, but none of the papers describes the situation we have. And that is why, you know, uh, we're in the age of the catastrophe, but no one is guilty and nothing has happened from that point. They, of view. We, we also read the news articles, like the, the titles of news articles, because this, that's what everyone reads, uh, that like, uh, I, I oh, God damn it. <laughs> anyway, the agency, let's call it the agency, right? Yeah, it's called uh, the agency, yeah. They haven't found any uh, bombs, minings uh, in the reactors, um, anyway, uh, anywhere in the nuclear power plant. Uh, although Ukrainian intelligence report that there is, there is some mining, uh, there is a threat of uh, bomb bombing of it, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Why does it happen like this? Uh, well, first, because uh, nuclear scientists are not people who can give judgments on military situation, and uh, perhaps they don't know how the bomb uh, looks like. It's not their job. Uh, and uh, that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, Russians just don't let this mission to walk around the station and uh, even talk to people directly. They communicate with the staff through the interpreter, and the FSB operative always stands in the background. And uh, the station is very limited in their operations, and they don't have any freedom of movement, and they cannot assess the different parts of the stations, because apart from the six reactors, there is also the biggest spent nuclear fuel uh, re reserve facility, which is situated in the plant. Uh, so there, there is a huge just collection of the spent nuclear fuel there. And uh, up to recent time, monitors were just not allowed to go there. Monitors were not allowed to assess the seashore, the shore, the river brink, and uh, uh, see whether there are bombs and mines allocated there. Even though we know that Russians deployed bombs uh, at the first day uh, when they occupied the station uh, in March last year. Uh, we know that they've uh, deployed bombs uh, all along the shoreline uh, at the Rio Bend. And uh, we know it from people from Energodar, because don't forget that it's, it's a big city. There were a couple of thousand, tens of thousand people living there. And that was the, th the deployment of bombs. It's not the thing you can really hide. 
but uh, the monitors uh, first don't have qualification to make judgments on whether they see weapons in it. But they reported, you know, we saw a truck, a military truck, in the uh, next to the mm, uh, generator, next to the mm-hmm. turbine. And um, but what was that truck? Was it empty? Was it loaded with something? Were there people inside? Were there weapons inside? Were there explosives inside? No one showed it. But they reported that they saw uh, a truck. So they also reported that they saw some tanks and heavy artillery. Uh, but uh, again, uh, it's not the facts that we can use uh, in discussion when we really discuss the military uh, question of military safety. And that's why uh, such a contradiction happens, because our operator, Energoatom, and our state regulatory body reports on daily basis on radiation background level and uh, cooling pond water level. And they are okay, and they've been okay all the time. Uh, and, uh, yes, and, every, and, and people in, in the agency say, well, you know, everything is good from the nuclear point of view. But from the military point of view, the situation is different, and there are no qualified monitors who can support our allegations, support our fears, or argue with us, or disprove us. There are just no qualified monitors in there because no one lets them in. And that's a contradiction. But we should really believe, because uh, to our intelligence, because it's not just intelligence who reports about uh, bombs. Uh, residents of Enerhadar, uh, people who live around, uh, people who have binoculars and can watch from another bank of Dnipro River, from Nikopol at Zaporozhye, also report on what they see. And they see uh, military activity, deployment of some strange objects, uh, helicopters in the air, artillery systems, tanks, and uh, Russians actually use uh, these site the territory of the nuclear power stations as a launching site for their artillery, for instance. They shoot on the opposite bank of the river almost every day, knowing that no one would fire back uh, because no, Ukraine will never fire back on its own nuclear power station. That's that's just crazy. And like what we're actually having here is some kind of a worst case Hollywood movie, I don't know, Counter-Strike uh, it's scenario. It's literally like yeah. a movie. It's like a terrorist have taken over a power plant and uh, threatened to destroy the whole... I mean, this is the, the this world, sounds yeah, like, a, a, like a shitty Hollywood movie, but it's not. It's real life and it makes how, me... Well, how I, it's I, very I just, just want to play a bingo every time Mark says this is crazy on our podcast, which is like every time we have a guest. Uh, I would like to stress that it's very important that we name uh, people who are in charge, who are there as terrorists. Because according to Ukrainian law, they are terrorists. And they are no, you know, Russian nuclear uh, scientists who come and see and uh, who uh, work there now on a daily basis are not, uh, you know, peaceful-minded scientists. They are criminals and they are nuclear terrorists. This is very important. The wording is important here. Uh, yeah, sure, because then these people, a couple of years later, when Ukraine deoccupies something, will go, I don't know, to Zurich or somewhere and be like, I'm a nuclear scientist. I've been taking yeah, well, care of Ukrainian mm-hmm. power plant when it was in danger. And look at me being all nice and science which is not true. You, as just you, said, them, he's... you just gave them a great idea. This is exactly what will happen, uh, for sure. I, I, just, like, no, I have this zero... W- zero doubt this this will happen yeah and this is what's going to happen it's the matter and it, it would happen with with my idea or without it the point is just this is what we should be prepared to argue with i in, in this terms i have a question uh like why isn't russian state nuclear energy corporation rosatom and everyone involved why aren't they sanctioned like this is obvious this this is happening on like well the whole world is watching and no one like does anything diplomatically or well the short answer is that because the entire world depends on Rosatom so much that they cannot sanction it uh, almost 14 percent of global uranium supplies come from russia from Rosatom almost 20 percent of reactors in the entire world are uh, Soviet reactors, reactors with Soviet design, who uh, consume Russian Soviet designed nuclear fuel, 
which is supplied by Rosatom. Twenty uh, percent of European uranium supplies come from Rosatom. So, if you sanction that uh, monster, then you will leave United States and Europe without electricity. That's the thing which no one actually wants to do. Uh, another thing is that Rosatom uh, it has been building nuclear power stations all over the world, and uh, now they're finishing project in Turkey. Uh, in Egypt, and uh, they're about to start a new build in Hungary. And uh, the world ah. obviously ah, interesting. doesn't want Hungary. to hmm. quarrel with such big countries like Turkey or Egypt because, you know, no one can offer them a substitute. Uh, it's not the thing that uh, in nuclear business you just cannot, you know, take reactor developed by one vendor and put it into a building uh, built by another vendor. It just doesn't go that way. Uh, and Russia, Rosatom, when they uh, signed for a contract for a new build in any part of the world, they signed the contract for a hundred years ahead. Uh, they have obligations for a century. Uh, these obligations include uh, education of the staff, uh, creating, assisting in creating regulatory body, uh, fuel supplyment, uh, then at the end, backhand operations concerned with uh, uh, shutting down NPPs and decomposition. So it is a huge monster. Uh, it's for the world. It's just like another Gazprom. So it's another energy weapon that Kremlin uses. And the uh, United States with Rosatom are in the same situation as Germany was with Gazprom in terms of energy dependency. But there are and no these, actual substitution for Russian fuel, right? Right time. now, no, because apart from uh, raw uranium, which Russians control very well, they also control, uh, have a huge stake in global uh, enrichment uranium supply. Enrichment is the thing that is not allowed to everyone. Only United States, France, Russia, China enrich uh, uranium on an industrial scale, and some countries like India, China, uh, perhaps Israel, uh, and perhaps Iran, enrich yeah. uranium in some smaller, uh, in much more smaller scales. So this is uh, a dangerous thing to do, and uh, the world should just, you know, be uh, consistent. You cannot sanction Gazprom, and uh, on the same time letting us atom to operate. Because literally, we suggest uh, the same hands of the same monster or the same energy weapon. Uh, these are the things that are absolutely the same in terms of devastation, dependency, and influence. And we are much more stuck with them than with with Russian gas and in, in, in oil. Unfortunately, unfortunately, you cannot go. And, there is no shop where you can get and you know shop for some enriched uranium, uh, some oh, uh, new fuel, uh, new fuel uh, rods next to the cigarettes and donuts. And nuclear fuel. But wasn't that what 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 the North Korea was doing? Just randomly shopping for some. New <laughs> I'm just. I'm kidding. The point is, uh, I'm getting depressed uh, again. <laughs> This is what this show will do to you guys. Please subscribe and like this video so you get if depressed, you're depressed with us. <laughs> yes, and please donate to our channel. You can find links below where you can, you know, just... We're not going to... This is not going to be used for a mental treatment. It's just we're going to keep the channel alive, I guess. Just so you can watch <laughs> us slowly succumb to depression with all this knowledge. But anyway. We're still anti-suicide show because, you know, whatever we have work here, it's much worse than you, any situation of your life, guys. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can, I... like, yeah, 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 you can cheer up, like, look at uh, miserable Ukrainians, uh, think about your Be... life, how it's, how it's privileged and good and actually, like... Have, yeah, living you know, on the edge of a possible nuclear catastrophe. Yeah. Yay! Second, second one in a row, you know, another yeah. thing where Ukraine could bet for first place. Yeah, and on that on that note, we are going to end. Thank you very much, Constantine. Um, it was really nice to have Pleasure. you here, and I hope I, I I I loved having you here, but I hope we won't need having you here. Um, <laughs> in terms of nuclear safety, maybe no, as a like political analyst, a, yes, yeah, but not like in nuclear, yeah. 
It's like going to a doctor. Like I love you, but I just I hope I don't need to see you anytime soon because the next time I need to see you, it means some you know shit is going down, and we you know don't take iodine. By the way, listen to our friend Kostintin here. No. He- uh, actually, uh, I will try to be a little serious and down to a little bit more alarmistic. Uh, the nuclear issue shouldn't be some unspoken thing. Uh, we are very open about the risk which we have here. And we also want really to talk with the West about why Rosatom has, was not sanctioned yet. That's the huge issue. And uh, that's the huge problem, which actually affects us and affects any country that would uh, build uh, a nuclear relations with Russia. Because uh, for Russians, nuclear energy is not a question of sustainability a better future with uh, no gas emissions. It's the matter of pure politics and influence. It's their nuclear weapon, and that's uh, a weapon of actually uh, just blackmailing and hijacking other countries, which receive a nuclear power station for free from Russia, because they usually build it on Russian state money. But then... uh, they just get stuck to this energy monster and cannot detach from it. And that's something you cannot predict when you take something from Russia for free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, it's very strange because, you know, Hungary, Hungary, really, Hungary. Uh, Russian, new Russian uh, nuclear power station in the center of Europe. Wow. It's weird. Uh, like, still- if it's not built yet, probably they can sanction Rosatom in some way and don't allow like building Russian nuclear station in European Union. Yeah, but we're Europe. talking about Hungary here. You European know, they... Union allowed, allowed the station to be built and issued a license. And regulator body of Hungary also issued a license. And they and it's happened in last year, a year ago. Uh, in the midst of a war in Russia, the occupying Russian Chernobyl attack on station, Ukraine. and yeah, and wow. in Hungary, sanctioning building of another Rosatom nuclear power plant. This is this is great. Well, I now this. I feel I feel even worse. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Krista. Thank you for 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 coming to us. And guys, uh, hopefully, if nothing nuclear happens, see you next week. Mm-hmm.